right, get this thing going. Okay, so let's start with Chitahari's question. Let's see where is it here. Okay, so Chitahari says, I was reading an article on radastomy from a lecture by Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasthi Thakur and came across this, quote, one can only understand such topics if the functions of the soul have awakened to the taste of Madhurya Rati or divine love. But those whose hearts contain an intense mood of Vatsalya Ras can also completely appreciate the sweetness and beauty of such pastimes, end quote. The first sentence makes sense, but the second not so much, since as we know, Vatsalya and Madhurya are incompatible. What is Pakistanta Saraswati Thakur saying here? Yes. Well, I think that uh, first of all, we have to appreciate what it means that one rasa is incompatible with another. Or to use uh, the terms of Rupa Goswami, he used the terms enemies and friends. Some rasas are friends with other rasas, some are enemies. Um, <clears throat> so when we say that a rasa is an enemy or incompatible, in this case, Vatsalya with Madhurya, one of the primary ways in which uh, that's to be understood is that, for example, when we look at uh, poetry hmm, um, or drama, if we have a depiction, let's say, of Yashoda, Krishna's mother, Krishna's mother sees him waking on the bed, she weeps, so uh, there are sattvic, there's a sattvic above. Uh, she feels some anxiety because she notices what appears to be some bruises, uh, some marks on his body. There's your, you know, your Sanchari or Vyabhichari Bhav. Um, she herself is the, is the um, Alamuna Bhav. Krishna is the object of love, so the Vishai. Alamana. She's an Ashraya Alamana. Um, she conducts herself at outwardly in ways that, uh, let's say, milk pours from her breast. Oh, that would be a subject of uh, other actions that are Anubhavs. So you've got these different ingredients uh, for Matsali Rasa, right? So if you, let's say, you write a poem or a verse. And you got all these ingredients in there, and then you insert um, some line that says, "And she found him very romantically attractive." You know that that becomes like <laughs> that. That's uh, um, not beautiful. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is that for Yashoda, for example, who's steeped in Vatsalya Bhava, mm -hmm, the idea of having Madhurya Bhava with Krishna is incompatible. So that is, the, in one sense, the primary way in which it's, the Ras is incompatible. It doesn't, it, 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 uh, um, it would be, poetically speaking, to write like that would be a blemish, it wouldn't be pleasing. They, they, don't, they don't go together. So, um, Having said that, um, we could extend a little further the idea of incompatibility between rasas, in this case, Vatsalya and Madhurya, in as much as in the presence of Vatsalya, the Madhurya, the romantic life of her son, um, is a little bit, you know, inhibited, inhibited, especially because the nature of it there in the brudge is that it's parakia. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, however, that said, that's why we say, for example, that Balaram has uh, some, some portion of Vatsalya in his Bob, but when that's operative, when that comes to the fore, then Radha and Krishna together, Radha Rani will behave a little bit differently. So his Vatsalya will, will cause her um, Madhurya to be contained, right? To, to be contracted a little bit in terms of its outward expression. So these are examples of what do we mean by incompatible 
um, rasa. Now, that said, this doesn't mean that uh, Yashoda doesn't want Krishna to be with Radha. Mm, certainly she does. Mm. And she'll be sympathetic towards that idea, even though given the structure of the of the of the of the Leela drama of Braj, it's not possible. Mm. Because Krishna's astrological chart says that as a young, just, as he, just shortly after he returns to a young man, an adolescent, he's going to leave home. And so how can he marry a brudge girl when he's going off to other lands, other countries, Dwarka, Matura, it's going to be a prince and so forth. So it's a, it's a disappointment. But they have to follow, of course, the the astrological chart and uh, and so there's another arrangement is, is, is being made and of course this is all facilitating the beauty and the intimacy of parakia but but yasoda wants krishna to be with radha when radha comes every morning to cook she thinks he, he here's the ideal you know wife uh, for krishna um, now um so that's that's on the other side incompatibility doesn't mean that Yasoda doesn't like, you know, Radha or Radha and Krishna, the idea of them being together. Or it doesn't mean that Krishna and, 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 and Radha don't like, you know, their mothers and fathers. <laughs> uh, that, that's not what it means. So I'm extending the idea of what incompatibility of a rasa with another rasa means, it doesn't mean. Now, that said, I'll give one other example. In, in Priti Sandarbha, Jiva Goswami is talking about two types of Madhurya Bhav, one which is called Sambhog or Kantabhav, where the gopi uh, has direct romantic relationship with Krishna. And for example, in the case of Radha or Chandravali. And then there are those who don't have a direct relationship, don't want a direct relationship, but they want to attach themselves to the bhava of Akanta, like Radha. That he calls that tad anumodan. Anumodan means sympathetic. So they have sympathy for the relationship between Radha and Krishna. This is the Manjari. She has romantic feelings for Krishna, but they're suppressed by her service, dasya, if you will, within Kind of a kind of a dasya for for Radha, hmm? Where, whereby she wants to see Radha unite with 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 Krishna. So she has a type of Madhurya rasa, but it's called anumodan or tadbhav, rather than um, kanta or sambhog. Hmm? So she has it's very peculiar, but she has romantic love for Krishna, but doesn't want to have a relationship with Krishna because she sees Krishna loves Radha the most, right? So she wants to serve. Now, when Rupa Goswami or Jiva Goswami is giving an example of this, he doesn't really cite the Manjari Bhav there. Mm -hmm. um, but what he cites peculiarly is how in, in, in um, Mathura, the elders wanted Radha or Krishna to marry Rukmini. Mm -hmm. Rukmini was supposed to be married to Sishupal. They didn't like the idea. They were sympathetic and supportive of the idea that Krishna marry Rukmini. Mm -hmm. So he's saying that, that they have, this is an example of the Vatsalya Bhav, mm -hmm. these elders, that they have some sympathy for this. This is a, a, a drop of Madhurya is there. Mm -hmm. But this type of Madhurya, so that they don't, it's not incompatible because they don't have a direct one, have a direct relationship with um, with Krishna in romantic relationship. They're his elders, they, they, they love him um, in Vatsalya Bhav. Now, having said that, what is Bhakti Siddhanta talking about there? Well, I, I think really what he's, he's saying is that if we look at these relationships, 
the those who are in a romantic relationship with Krishna, the gopis, or assisting like this, they can understand. Hmm? Um, when we say that some coward boys can, they have a drop of Madhurya, the, the Narma Sakas. Otherwise, Sakas in general are favorable to it. They're not, they're not opposed to it. They're, they're favorable to it, but they, they're not particularly um, in, involved in it. Um, um, and as such, they don't understand it that well. Hmm? What's the difference then between a friend that you have that doesn't have a girlfriend? You get a girlfriend. Hmm? You can't quite figure out that part about you. Neither does it interest him that much. He's not, he doesn't get in the way. Sometimes say three is a crowd, but you know, to an extent, but they're favorable. But now if you take a mother and a father, hmm? They, because they have experience of romantic life themselves, so therefore they can appreciate it. This is what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur is saying. Because they already, because they all have their own experience of romanticism, they can have some better understanding of it. Now he's not going and you know he said that in a moment. You know, um, that's how he's looking at it. He could have come back and talked about it in other ways. Um, with regard to uh, the Narmasakas, for example, and even uh, and, and so on. But that, I believe, is um, what he's speaking about. And he's he's also also trying to explain something to or to you know to people in general or or devotees who don't understand Rasa Tattva. And you know he's giving a human kind of example there. Uh, Oh, but uh, how someone who's already married, you know, can appreciate something about the romantic life of those who are just getting, they've been infatuated themselves. So that's what he means. Does that help? Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. Good question. All right, the next question is sort of in the same line. It's from Atmachana and Kao. She asks about Radha. She says, is Radha a manifestation of the divine feminine, that feminine force of all creation, the Adi Shakti? And would it be more effective to chant in my japa and in my sadhana a mantra to Radha than Hare Krishna, Hare Ram, if my intention was to revere the feminine? the Mahashakti, and connect with her as she is who Lord Krishna worships in the Leela. Would that bring me closer to a Leela of higher consciousness after this body's death than revering a male god? Well, first of all, um, it's clear from the sacred texts of the Hindus, if you look at them comprehensively, which is one thing it is um, kind of a speciality of our particular Chaitanya Vaishnav Sampradaya. Srinivasa Charja commented uh, and praised the Goswamis in this regard when he said, Lokanam mitakarano tu bhubhane mandyo sharanyo nana shastravid, nana shastravikaran, I forget that, nana shastravikaran, puno saddharma samstapako. And it's really true. Um, I used to marvel um, in reading Prabhupada's books, all these references that he was giving to so many other texts uh, um, and so forth. And, and of course, this is, was the original work of the Goswami, says Srinivasacharya's verse that I just cited, says that they, they, they took these shastras, the sacred texts of the Hindus, and looked at them comprehensively, rather than being um, attracted to a particular text, a particular group of texts that ad advocate a particular path, the tantric texts, you know, or the, the, you know, the Agamas or, or, or the Upanishads, uh, this Purana about, uh, you know, the, the Varaha Purana, the Mahapurana, the Nishringa Purana, you know, the Nishringa Upanishad, um, which is 
kind of normally the case. Uh, a sadhu plugs into a particular path and exemplifies it. Others become attracted and so forth. And other texts are ignored. They took all these texts together. And, and then they uh, taught about the efficacy of bhakti, bhakti, the ultimacy of Radha and Krishna as far as uh, manifestations of, of the Godhead. Um, and um, and in, in doing it, they talked about this uh, fullest expression of divinity of Radha and Krishna directly and indirectly by way of speaking about other manifestations of divinity. All you know, those so many gods and goddesses in within Hinduism. Well, how do they all relate? Uh, what is their what is Shiva's position in relation to Krishna? What is Durga's position in relation to Krishna, Radha, uh, Brahma's position, uh, Indra, so on and so forth, this avatar, that avatar, Narayan. So it's very uh, extraordinary um, contribution that they made. Um, and of course, in, in doing so, they have posited and shown uh, support for the idea that Krishna is Swami Bhagavan, so the original fountainhead of all divinity. And Radha is the original Shakti. So I just mentioned that because you said, well, there's the feminine you know, aspect of existence and, and you know, and, and, and Radha is a manifestation of that. I just want to kind of turn that around. So all the Shakti, which is a, a feminine kind of perspective, uh, is to use our human um, sensibilities, we say feminine. Feminine uh, Shakti, uh, all the different Shakti manifestations, Mother Earth, right? Um, for example, uh, this goddess, that goddess, and so on and so forth. They're all manifestations of Radha. So Radha is the, is the, is the generating, like Krishna generates Shakti. All the Shaktis are then in, in the form of Radha. Uh, that's his inside, his Swarup Shakti, uh, that, that makes him sweet, but he's like sugar that can't taste itself. So, so that internal shakti is, we call it the swarup shakti, is fully manifest in the person of Radha. The one becomes two. This is an eternity, of course. There's no beginning, but we're limited by language to talk about it. So the one becomes two. And, and that makes for a, a truth or an absolute that, as the Taitari Upanishad said, rasa vaisa is rasa. You need two for rasa. You need the you need the object of love, and you need the personification of the love. Krishna is the object of love. Radha is the abode of love, the vessel of love, the very personification of that love in the fullest extent. Hmm? So these two are one, one and different at the same time. Hmm? They are the Godhead for us, and and. As Krishna is the source of all the different manifestations of the Godhead, both directly so in terms of Vishnu Tat, but indirectly in terms of the positions uh, adopted by the by the devas uh, and so forth. Similarly, Radha is the source of all the different shaktis of Lakshmi, Sita. Again, you go down to Bhumi, the Mother Earth, and so on and so forth. So she's the fountainhead. Now, um, I don't think, um, I wouldn't put it the way that you did. I understand why you did uh, that uh, if you'd rather, rather worship a feminine representative of the deity rather than a male one, I, I understand that, that thinking. And men have been pretty abusive to women for for you know uh, centuries, and so you could get a little tired of them, um, and uh, and you got to put up with them, I suppose. You know, find one of them, but still you fall short. So if you want 
the ultimate love, you know, maybe you think, let, let, let me just identify with the feminine principle here. Uh, so I can appreciate that from that point of view. But we have to think that as far as Radha goes, she is completely, entirely all about Krishna. So she is completely in, in love with Krishna. She embodies the fullest measure of love for Krishna. And of course, Krishna is, is conquered entirely by her love. So she is supreme in that sense. But we want to be careful. There's another sampradaya called the um, or spiritual community lineage called the Radha Balava Sampradaya. And they make Radharani the su supreme deity who Krishna is the, the husband of. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of, from a Gaudiya point of view, there's a lot of problems with that perspective. It might sound interesting, but as it plays out, um, obviously, in my opinion, uh, which is the opinion of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the, um, the way in which the Gaudias speak about Radha and Krishna is, is much more um, charming, philosophically accurate in terms of what the Upanishads and the sacred texts say and so on and so forth. That means to say there's a way in which we say from the point of view of Bhava that Radharani is in control. She is the Vrindavan Ishwari, right? Um, and conquers Krishna without, from a point of view of tattva, changing the position that Krishna is, after all, the source of everything. So, um, um, that said, um, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, then there is a very strong emphasis on the um, ideal of Radha's love and a commitment to assisting Radha in her love for Krishna. Mm -hmm. Even if that means Radha doesn't want to see Krishna today. And you'll help to, you'll, you'll stand in front of the, uh, the uh, forest bower and protect her if he wants to get in. Get out of here, Krishna. Get out of here. Uh, so this is a this is Bhav. This is this is very high, but uh, I mean after all, it's God. But um, um, so it's an extreme position, right? The the Radha Dasyam. Mm -hmm. It's a form of conjugal love in which the the Kama, or the, the desire, the attractiveness of Krishna, romantically is 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 suppressed by the beauty of the love of Radha for him that one wants to serve because she, she can satisfy him like like no one else. Why be a competitor of hers, right? So that's the idea. So so having said that, and, and you may know all these things, so forgive me, but um, still they're worth stating. With regard to your question directly, um, our in one sense, main mantra is the Nam mantra that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu recommended, which is also recommended in the in the um, in the Upanishads for Kali Yuga. Um, nam nam kali kam ashana ashana, right? Sarva Veda Shudishade. Um, it said in all the Vedas that these sixteen syllables, or these uh, thirty-two syllables, and then it states that Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama. Rama. For Kali Yuga, we'll, we'll deliver one entirely from Kali Yuga and so forth. Now, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says it'll do more than that. Uh, it'll take you into this uh, secret uh, realm uh, we're, we're talking about, right? And, and now, with regard to that uh, mantra and the syllables, um, 32 syllables, they come in 16 names. So, Hare is two syllables, that's one name. Krishna is two syllables, that's another. Ram is two syllables, that's another. So one of the ways of looking at this mantra that's prominent in our Samadaya is that the name Krishna, those two syllables refer to Krishna himself. The names, the name Rama refers to Krishna also, who is also known as Ramana. 
um, like we find in Vrindavan at Gopal Bhatta Goswami's temple, Radha Raman, Radha and Raman. So the name Krishna refers to Krishna. This, in this sense, the name Ram refers to Krishna. And what about Hare? Well, Hare is um, is Hari in the vocative case. Vocative case means like calling out. It's calling out Krishna, Radha, Radhe would be. Uh, so when you want to say Hari in the vocative case, it comes out as Hare. So Hare means Hari also. But there's another perspective with regard to that name, which is pertinent to your question. And that is that Hare is also the vocative of Hara and um, referring to the Shakti. And when looked at like that, the name Hare is thought to refer to Krishna. So there's Hare in between Krishna and Rama and in between, you know, both of those other names intertwined. So already relevant to your question, within the Maha Mantra, that is the main mantra, it's a non mantra. Varsampradaya, uh, we find uh, an, a, um, a name of Radha and an advocacy or an appeal, let's say, an appeal mm, for um, entering into her, her service with regard to her romantic sentiments for Ramana and Krishna. You know, Krishna, the same person with two different names. So you're asking, you know, could we chant a mantra rather than to Krishna, to Radha? Well, the non mantra includes that. That's one answer. Now, that's a non mantra. Now, we have um, also a, the main mantra in our Sampradaya, the Diksha mantra, is the Gopal mantra or the Krishna mantra. And it consists of the names Krishna, Govinda, Gopi Janabalaba, all in the dative case. So Krishnaya, Govindaya, Gopi Janabalabhaya. Here the dative case rather than the vocative case, which is which is the, the uh, where the names appear in the Mahamantra, as I explained. The dative case is like submission. Give me, give me Krishnaya, let me give myself to Krishna. Oh, Govinda, I offer myself to Govinda. To Gopi Janabalab, I offer myself. So the mantra is like that. It has a seed that precedes it. And then these names, Krishnaya, Govindaya, Gopi Janabalabaya. And then there's a word at the end also. Now, the names in the dative case are already speaking about submission. Let me give myself to Krishna. To, 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 to. Who, who is Govinda? Who is Gopi Janabalaba? Gopi Janabalaba means who loves the gopis. Let me give myself to him. But then there's the word Swaha, which also is like giving. And Swaha uh, represents the Swayam Shakti, who is the very personified form of the fullest giving. So I've written a commentary on this in the book. Uh, Gopal Tapani Upanishad, wrote a commentary on Gopal Tapani Upanishad. And, um, and the words in the Gopal Mantra, or the Krishna Mantra that I'm explaining, are all explained there. And when it comes to the word Swaha, my commentary brings out the fact that here Swaha refers to Radha. So we have Radha's name already. And it's the operative word in a sense in the in the Gopal mantra. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we, we have her name there in, in the Gopal mantra. We have her name there in the Hare Krishna mantra. So I, therefore, despite the fact that our Sampradaya is so focused on Radha's love for Krishna and the way to Krishna's heart is through 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 Radha. Mm -hmm. um, while we don't have a direct Radha mantra, this is a little bit indirect. And Krishna says in the Gita, in the Bhagavatam, that that speech that is indirect 
that's very pleasing to me. Uh, that's a, that's a more subtle. So that is my answer. Um, and of course, typically, I should say, of all most almost all the deities, we have Radha Krishna, Radha Govinda, Radha Gopinath, uh, Radha this and Radha that. And typically, the name Radha is mentioned first. So you can also sing Jai Radha Govinda and Jai Radha Govinda. Radha Govinda and so forth, Jai Radha. So there's there's no, if you really study our lineage, <laughs> there's no shortage of an emphasis on on Radha. Mm -hmm. um, she permeates the whole Sabradaya. Indeed, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna. I said earlier that Krishna becomes two as Radha and Krishna. Radha Krishna Pranay Vikritir Ladini Shakti Rasmad. She is the Ladini Shakti of Krishna manifesting personally. He is sweet, but sugar can't taste itself. So through the manifestation of Radha, Krishna is tasting himself, right? Um, the verse goes on to say, Radha Krishna Pranay. Radha is a transformation tonight of Krishna of Krishna's love. We call it the Ladini Shakti. Hmm. Radha Krishna Pranaya Bhakti Ladini Shakti Rasmad. Um, what is the next verse? Ekatmano. Ekatmano. So the, the two become one, and that one again becomes two. That that two again becomes one as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hmm. Krishna becomes Radha, the one becomes two. The two are trying to understand themselves hmm, and experience the union that love is about where there is no other. Hmm. When they get so close to one another to, to, to do away with a sense of any other, the two are one, Radha starts thinking like Krishna, Krishna starts thinking like Radha, and there's still the two. Hmm. Well, there's two. Have become one in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and that problem has been solved. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna. In the bhava of Radha, this is it's, 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 it's core of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. So it's really saturated with, permeated with um, the um, idea of serving, serving Radha. I hope that helps. Jai Radha. Jai Radha. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from uh, Ananta Govinda. He has a follow-up on, there was some discussion about Brahma a couple of weeks back. So he says, uh, we understand that his concert is Saraswati, but also hear how Saraswati is an expansion of Lakshmi. How does Jiva, uh, how, do, how do Jiva and Vishnu Tattvas combine in the identity of Lord Brahma? And about the many heads, how to understand a million-headed Brahma of the universe? Can you read the first part of the question again? Okay, so he's saying, we understand that, that Brahma's concert is Saraswati, but also we hear that she is an expansion of Lakshmi. How do Jiva and Vishnu Tattvas combine in the identity of Lord Brahma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I understand the question. Um, of the um, eternal forms of the Shakti Tattva, like Lakshmi, Radha, Lakshmi, Gopis, Queens of Dwarka, and so forth, so there's Lakshmi. Let's take her probably to your question. There are, there are material forms of these goddesses as well. So, for example, Durga is another name for Radha, it means Durga. Ga means to go, Dur means difficult, difficult to go to. And there's a material manifestation of um, the goddess. 
Durga, and it means difficult to go from, presiding over the material world. So this is the peculiarity of the Sarup Shakti, that all of the divinities in Shakti Tattva that are manifest in the Paravyom, in the spiritual world, there are material representations of them. So there's a divine Saraswati, and there's a material manifestation of Saraswati, Lakshmi, Durga, so on and so forth. Um, so when we say that Saraswati is manifest in Lakshmi, I guess as much as you want to say that Radha, Lakshmi is a manifestation of, of Radha. I, I don't. I don't remember uh, reading that, that, that Saraswati is a direct manifestation of Lakshmi in some progression like that, like 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 Lakshmi is a manifestation of Radha. But it, but in any case, yes, Narayan has a Lakshmi, has a Saraswati, um, and so forth. But there are material manifestations of these who would then be um, associated with uh, with Brahma. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that answers your question. Um, and the second part of your question was, what was it? He was saying um, about the many heads of Brahma. Oh, yeah. How, how do we how um, understand the million-headed Brahmas of the universes? And then he also asks, are they states of mind? Well, I think that you, you, know, you have to look at um, the narrative section of the sacred texts for what they are. They are the Puranas, for example. They're full of stories. They're ways of talking about that which is mandated in the Vedas. The Vedas are said to speak like the king, do this, no questions asked. The Puranas speak like a friend and they tell the same principle, you should do this by way of a story. Mm -hmm. um, the Puranas are the, are the, are the uh, Smriti, that which is the Shruti, the Upanishad, that which is heard, which has no origin. You hear it in meditation, then you remember and reflect on it, and out of that something comes. That's called a Smriti. Mm -hmm. That's the Mahabharata, the Puranas, uh, and so on and so forth, so many texts. Um, and so there's some relativity with regard to those texts compared to the Upanishads, but, but they're um, at the same time, with regard to the Puranas, they're explaining the Vedas in ways that common people may not be able to uh, understand them or who couldn't hear them, those, those mantras and so forth. So in that sense, they're more important, but there, but there are some relativity to them. They're, they're, they have uh, human uh, sources, if you will. Um, so um, the point I'm making is that that's in the Puranas, where you have these kind of descriptions of Brahma with four heads and ten heads and thousands and millions, and so on and so forth. Um, these these stories are talking about certain principles. They're not just allegories that, that are disappear, because if you understand what they're talking about, if you understand, for example, the stories, the narrative of the Bhagavatam, if the Bhagavatam, as it is said in the Guru Purana, is a commentary on the Brahma Sutras, the Vedanta Sutras, and the Vedanta Sutras or a shorthand explanation of what all the Upanishads are saying, giving them context. This statement over here, this one over here, this one over here, pulling them together. Mm -hmm. Then the stories, the narrative of the Bhagavatam, and all the, sto and all the stories there. Mm -hmm. um, they were all commenting on the Shruti, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and 
and if you look carefully at the whole picture as the Goswamis have, then you find that what the Shruti is talking about is the fact that uh, there is a oneness and a difference in, between Atma, Parma, between the Jiva, between the, the, the individual soul and, and the Godhead. There's an interaction between them. It's called Lila. And so this is what Bhagavatam, for example, of all the Puranas, which is the Mahapurana, uh, the, the, the most complete of them, is bringing home. Mm -hmm. So it's bringing home a certain uh, uh, understanding as to the nature of transcendence. So you can't get lost in the weeds, so to speak here, about so many things that are said, how they all fit in. It's, it's just a way of trying to talk about something that's really ineffable. I mean, they do a good job. And, um, and, it, and if you understand it, in the way I'm talking about it, the real doesn't disappear. Indeed, it, it, it's one way to say, the Upanishads say there's only Brahman undifferentiated. Mm -hmm. Then these other books talk about talk about that by metaphor and so forth. And when we're done with them, they all they all disappear and we merge into eternal silence. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the Upanishads are saying if we look at them carefully, which we can understand from the Bhagavatam, which is Shruti Sarumekam, the very cream and essence of the Upanishads. Mm -hmm. No, they're talking about an interaction within transcendence and variegated nature of transcendence. Mm -hmm. And, and the reverse a bias, which is a problem in material life, which is uh, has its place in the realm of love, a bias for wrong, this manifestation of divinity, a bias towards Krishna for that manifestation of divinity. Mm -hmm. It's all beautiful and so forth. So because that is what's found in the Upanishads, when the Stories of the Bhagavatam, particularly now, uh, particularly with regard to Krishna and Leela, a little different from your question, but uh, the stories of Brahma are found there. Uh, with with Krishna and Leela, um, um, we are we are to learn as we get a feeling for Vaishnavism to understand the Leela in a non literal way but not in a non-literal way in which the Mayavadins will understand it because they have a different understanding of what the Shruti is saying. Mm -hmm. People they think, well, it's just a temporal thing that goes away, the Leela is done and we enter into eternal silence. No. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to say, well, the Leela is not literal. It's a limited expression of that reality that we call Leela that that we can only come up with given the limitations of thought and word, which we're using here to convey that experience. Mm -hmm. So thought and word go there and come back. They can't, they can't fully go. But there are ways that we can talk about it that aren't untrue, but they don't give the whole picture. So these texts, these kind of narratives about Brahma's heads and these things, these are all ways of trying to talk about something that doesn't lend itself, uh, uh, can't be entirely captured by words. So sometimes you have to think, well, you know, what's really being said here? Number one, number two, you have to think, well, what, what relevance is it? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, that there are other worlds, that they're bigger than the world that we live in, mm -hmm. that there are. Mm, you know, we're trying to think, but look, I got two heads. It works like this. I think it works like this. The fact of the matter is, we don't even know how our own head works. Gurnish was telling me the other day he did, was doing some research and he found out that the, the, um, in medicine, it's understood that we only understand a fraction of our gut, how it works. What to speak of understanding the human brain, which is so much more complicated than our di digestive organ system. I mean, there's, there's no comparison. The brain is so complex. And um, I was listening not long ago to this fellow named Neil, what's his name, Neil DeGrasson or something like that? DeGrasse Tyson, I think. Yeah, okay, anyway, he's a famous scientist uh, who 
has become a good spokesperson for, for science. And um, although previously he had been a, quite clearly taken an atheistic perspective, in this talk he was taking an agnostic perspective. And he was asked, the way he got into that and explaining that was he was asked, how much do we know, in, you know, in science? Because I think the average person thinks, man, we know a friggin' lot. <laughs> And we have really retired a lot of superstition and foolishness from the past. And, and you know, we, we just about know everything here. You know? Well, he said, you know, there, of course, from the point of view of modern astrophysics, there's something called dark matter and dark energy that makes up this much of the universe. And he went through these calculations and he gave a quantitative answer and said that 90, I think he said 96% of the universe, we don't know what it is. We know 4%. So we don't know too much. Um, so it's another example. Of, and, and, and then the, the interviewer said, well, then how can you be sure that there's no God? He said, I'm not sure. Hmm? He said, when such and such an astronaut was going off, you can hear me, I said, Godspeed. And people looked at me like, what are you talking, God? And so he said, you know, we don't know. Hmm? So, um, So yeah, we don't we don't know too much. Uh, we think we have a head. How could someone have four? How could someone have a million? What does it mean? Uh, I don't think it's too relevant to try to figure out exactly what it means. You know, other than to me, it means there are many realms. They're bigger than the one we're in. You know, uh, every atom's a universe uh, in, in in a sense. And this is how we look at more important. I would say, look how the idea of Brahman with a million heads has been used in the Bhagavatam or in the Gaudiya um, Harikata. Uh, you know, where does it come up? Well, the story, one of the stories is that Brahma goes to Krishna, right, in Dwarka. What's that story? He asks um, Krishna a question. I forget that. There's a story like this. Anyway, Krishna reveals there's Brahmas with a hundred heads and a million heads. And Brahma, who's very proud of his foreheads, starts to feel as small as he is, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the Brahma Vimohan Leela in the Bhagavatam, then Brahma is also thinking, I'm the Brahma. Look at me. He uses his power on Krishna, you know, to, to test him and so forth. And then Krishna shows his power, which causes Vimohan, extreme bewilderment. Brahma, who in the end sees millions of Brahmas, some of them with millions of heads, and, and they're all emanating from the Ryans, who are all emanating from Krishna in, in different universes and so on and so forth. So how is it used? That's what's important to us, right? What's it saying to us? The, the position of Brahma, Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Puna Avartino. It's all in the, it's right there. Read this verse of the Bhagavad Gita and everything that's, that's that's expanded out into the Bhagavatam in this connection, it's right there. Abrahma Bhuvana Loka, Punara Vartinajana, Mamu Peta Tukonteya, Punarjana Vartinajana. There's the Brahma Mohan Mohan Lila in one verse of the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm? This is how you have to read these texts. You can find everything in Bhagavad Gita. Hmm? This is an example. The verse says, Abrahma Bhuvana Loka, from the planet of Brahma on down. Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Punaro Artinu Everyone has to come come down, take birth again, including Brahma, the highest position in the in the material world, the abode of Brahma, the realm of intellect itself. It's the realm of intellect. There's another way of thinking about it. so how big is intellect? What can you do with your intellect? Well, you can make it uh, you can do anything with your intellect. You can't maybe manifest it, but you can think about it. It could be like this. It could be like that. You can, you can do away with yourself, you know, philosophize yourself away. Uh, um, intellect is very, very subtle, very, very supple. Uh, uh, so, you know, you can, you, you can say he had big intellect, four heads, a million heads. This is, you know, again, one way to think about it. So Brahma saw there, I'm small in the Brahma Vimohan Leela. That's the, that's the context in which we hear there were Brahmas with millions of heads. So that's what to learn from it. 
score with like how it's exactly how they fit on his neck or what you know what does it mean what what is the form of brahma in this world that's a whole other thing the, the, the form of brahma we depict brahma in a human-like form with four heads but if you if you were to really study even the Bhagavata very carefully, you come up with a different idea of what 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 Brahma's form is like. Mm-hmm. We have a human artistic depiction of it. Mm-hmm. A guy like us with four heads, but it's but it's, that's not what's what's really being uh, described there. Now you might look like that when you see him. Uh, that's another thing. Um, uh, how uh, how he appears to the human eye if he should show himself, but. Um, that's how I think about um, such 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 questions. I don't mean to insult you in any way by my answer. I say in the way you're thinking about it is wrong. It's not the way I would think about it. Mm-hmm. What would I what would I draw from that? You know, from the idea that, that this idea there's a realm with million heads. That's what I would draw. From. And I might could go on about it, but that's basically the idea. I hope that you find that encouraging and helpful. Thank you very much. Chaitan Acharan made a comment in the chat. He says, Spanish physicist Javier Santa Loya, I hope I didn't butcher that last name, says that it is more likely that God exists than does not exist according to mathematical probability. Interesting. Santa Javier or something, Kijaya. <laughs> we would uh, like to hear his, we would like to hear his uh, his mathematical explanation. And reasoning. If you could forward that to us in Spanish, uh, we can get it translated. We would like to read his his explanation. But I agree with him. Okay. The next question is from Krishna Sevaka. He says, "Please, please accept my obeisances, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for answering my previous question, saying that Krishna has compassion for all the jivas who are represented by his Koshta Bajul." Would you be so kind as to clarify some uh, tattva and answer a question? My understanding is that the jiva is comprised of both a subtle body and a gross physical body. The subtle body meaning mind, intelligence, and false ego. The atma is spiritual, a unit of consciousness, and part and parcel of Krishna. I am the atma here now with the material jiva form but simultaneously also have an eternal spiritual jiva form or swarup. And my further, further question is, in light of the above conceptions, are there any jivas here that do not have an atma, but are rather only an expansion of maya, paramatma, mahavishnu, sankarshan, or balara? Thank you. Well, uh, I think that uh, you're right in one sense, the jiva, or the jivatma refers to the atma within the material world where the atma is identified with matter and as a result it has a physiological and psychological um, features because the psychological sense of sense of its physical self so that's the jivatma the jiva so the so when we say I have an atma, that's the jiva talking. <laughs> the jiva thing atma. One who realizes the atma and is no longer a jiva in that sense. It has transcended the, the psychological and physiological um, boundaries. Then um, that person doesn't have an atma. That person is an atma. The only sense in which we have an atma is as much as we're disenfranchised from it by identification with matter and have a material body and mind that we think we are. Mm -hmm. And thinking that I am this body mind, I think I, the body mind, I have an atma. Mm -hmm. But when I'm free from that body mind identification, I realize I am an atma. Mm-hmm. And going further into your question, as an atma, I have a a nature, mm-hmm. a nature and a purpose. Mm-hmm. I have a purpose. 
and I, I exist as a part and parcel of Bhagawan with the purpose of serving him. I am, uh, uh, my purpose is how do you save him? This is my dharma, my, my nature. The dharma of the jiva is to, is, is to serve Bhagawan. It's dependent on Bhagawan. Uh, it's uh, his uh, own manifestation for his own pleasure. So its purpose is to serve. And, and um, so when we talk about the purpose of the jiva, then we talk about its swoop. Mm -hmm. As Krishna has covered, it says, Krishna Surup Hoy Krishna Tidas. Krishna of the Jiva, its Swarup, its nature is Krishna Das, to serve Krishna. And so that love, love has a shape, right? It has a form. So this is what we call the, 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 the Swarup. Of the, of, of, the, of the jiva, right? Um, now you asked further, are there, there are beings, I guess you're asking, that are manifestations of maya, maya shakti that don't have an atma? Well, I, you know, there is, there, there, there is not living beings, no. Atma means the living being. Mm -hmm. um, even if that living status has not reached biological life, um, are there Atmas? Are there those who have, what was the other part of the question? Well, there are, there are Jeevas manifested from Paramatma. There are Jeevas manifest from, from Mahasankrashan and Vaikuntha. Not jivas, atmas, vibhinamsa. There are parts and parcels of of the Godhead. Let's call it that. Manifest from the Paramatma, and because the Paramatma um, also oversees the Maya Shakti. These two come in, into contact with one another. It becomes the problem for the Atma, so the Paramatma avatars to resolve the problem, so that the Atma can meet its maker. But in the spiritual world. Then there are jivas manifest, or not jivas, but atmas <laughs> manifest. Um, but Mahasankarshan, he said to be the, the shelter of the Tatasta Shakti. So in, in his expansion as Paramatma, he manifests jivas that are in atmas that are in this world. They call them jivatmas. And then in the spiritual world, he also manifests. Um, Associates for serving Narayan. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur has expanded that, expanded that to say that Baladev expands similarly in, uh, in Goloka for Seva. So I, I think I've answered your questions. I hope. Thank you very much. Uh, it's eight, uh, 9 30. We have, okay. uh, so we'll leave the rest for, the next, for next week. There are more questions? Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, we we'll, we'll go on next week. Let me see, let's see. Oh, here, now maybe you asked me a question. Atma Charan Karun, can't see the last part of your name. Okay, I'm, I had seen your, your beautiful self before. Nice to see you. I see Kana Ram is there, Sadhvi, Mohini, Chaitanya Charan, and Krishna Kumar, yeah. so many devotees, very nice. Julia Saki is there, Nadia Dhan, Omkha, Krishna Chaitanya, Ram Mohan, Anantula Vinda, Gopal Nandini, Madhavi Kumasta, Nadia, oh, that's Madhavi Mohan also. Okay, nice to be with all of you there. It's just uh, just to go in and die. So yeah, hope to be with you next week. Go with Premanande.
Rybou. Rybou. Shilaguru Maharaj ki jai. Um, this week, uh, it's going to be Shamsundar giving a class on Thursday about how a pigeon can be a guru. It's talking about the 24 gurus, so that might be humorous and entertaining and informative. I uh, hope to see you there, and let's meet up next.